Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. This is video number 10 in our reputation of Sam Frost's book, uh, The Parousia of the Son of Man. Mr. Frost is a former preterist. Uh, he now condemns the full preterist view as heresy. He says those who believe in the full preterist view are not Christians. We are heretics. We are doomed, etc., etc. Now, this is ostensibly his attempt to demonstrate the fallacy of the full preterist position. I would say this. Mr. Frost position that he takes in this book. If what he says is true, it also destroys the partial preterism of Kenneth Gentry and Gary DeMar and Joel McDermott and a host of other prominent post-millennial uh, writers and author, some of whom have been supportive of Mr. Frost and helped produce, as a matter of fact, his book, Why I Left Preterism. American Vision, which of course Gary DeMar was president, Joel McDermott is now president, they helped produce that book. And so the irony here is, and it's, that may be the reason why uh, this book was not pr produced by American Vision, certainly was not published by Kenneth Gentry, and it may be, I don't know, but it certainly may be that if and when American Vision read this manuscript, if, if Kenneth Gentry read this manuscript, they could not endorse it because the approach that Mr. Frost takes flies in the teeth of, of what they teach. It is an absolute rejection. Now, look, if what Mr. Frost is saying is true, then it doesn't matter if they like it or not. Truth is truth, and I understand that position. I'm simply pointing out the irony here that Mr. Frost has been initially supported by these men who produced his first book, American Vision. But now, for some reason, they didn't print and publish this book for him. He had to publish it himself. And the thing that I do know, <coughs> pardon me, the thing that I do know is that this book is an utter rejection of their eschatology. It flies in the face of what Kenneth Gentry teaches on the Olivet Discourse. It flies in the face of what Gary DeMar and what Joel McDermott teach on the Olivet Discourse. So it's very understandable that those men would not want to publish this book. But enough of that. On pages 22 and following of his book, Mr. Frost sets out to give an explanation of Matthew chapter 24 in the Olivet Discourse. And I've said this before. I must say it again in regard to the pages that follow page 22. You will seldom, seldom find anything more confused or confusing or self-contradictory or anything that stands more diametrically opposed to what, the, what Jesus actually said in the Olivet Discourse. Now, since I am currently covering, obviously, the Olivet Discourse in my morning musings, I would ask that you pay careful attention to where we are at in that series. I am currently talking about the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, and what you have to see is that what I'm presenting there is another refutation of Mr. Frost's book. So, I, I'm going to keep my comments on this section relatively brief, but I want to point out some things that just jump off the page 
of how, of how glaringly bad they truly are. Now, page 23, I'm just sitting here trying to figure out out of, out of everything I could address, how, you know, what exactly should I address? Uh, on page 23, he says, <clears throat> and he has been discussing the disciples' question about the sign of the end of the age. And he says, well, a sign is given by a prophet, true enough. And a sign demonstrates what is coming. They're looking for a sign. Now, here's what's interesting. Mr. Frost says they're not looking, the disciples were not asking for a sign of Jesus' presence in the fall of Jerusalem. No, 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 no. He says they were asking for a sign of his absence from them. Do you mean to tell me the disciples wouldn't know when Jesus was absent from them? Seriously? Now, Mr. Frost sees a train coming, evidently, and so he says what they're really asking for is a sign of his absence from them, but his presence in heaven. Now, there's a kernel, just a kernel, of truth to be found here. But then he distorts it. So, keeping that in mind, he then says, it should be noted that in Matthew's version, the sign is not just of his presence, but also the end of the age. I agree with that. That's what the disciples asked about. Now, you need to know, you need to know that initially, just not long ago on Facebook, Sam Frost initially said the disciples were confused in their questions. They were wrong. He immediately then, when I addressed that issue and proved that they were not confused and they were not wrong according to their own statements in Matthew chapter 13, 50 and 51, he immediately turned around and changed his argument and said, no, they were right. They did link, correctly so, the fall of Jerusalem with the end of the world in their own mind. Well, then they were right or wrong. Because obviously the quote, end of the world and the end of our age didn't end with the fall of Jerusalem. You see, folks, this issue of whether or not the disciples were confused or wrong is absolutely critical for our, our understanding. Jesus predicted the destruction of the city and the temple. The disciples thought parousia of Christ, his presence, and the end of the age. Let me ask you again. Look, you've got to keep this in mind. This is absolutely critical as we are about to discuss what we're about to discuss. What age did that temple represent? When someone tells me the disciples were asking about the end of the Christian age, the end of our age in which you and I are now living, it tells me they are divorcing their concept of the end of the age from the context of Jesus' prediction and the disciples' question. Jesus was not predicting the end of time. He was not predicting the end of the Christian age. That, that temple and that city did not represent time itself. It did not represent the Christian age. It did not represent the new covenant age. It represented Moses and the law of Moses and the age of Moses and the law. Anyone who denies that is denying history. Denying Bible. But you see, Mr. Frost goes ahead to say, it should be noted that in Matthew's version, the sign is not just of his presence, but also the end of the age, which upon, listen, to, listen carefully, which upon hearing of the destruction of the temple and its buildings carried with it a grand annihilation of the world. So in other words, the disciples did think about the end of time and the end of, of the time-space continuum and the physical cosmos. 
the annihilation of the world. Then he repeats it. Thus, hearing Jesus speak of complete annihilation of the temple in Jerusalem, inferred the end of the age. Well, it did refer or infer the end of the age, but Mr. Frost says it inferred the end of the current age, the Christian age. Ladies and gentlemen, I have said this many, many, many times. It is such a simple, but such a profound point. The age of Christ, the age of the new covenant, has no end. I've shared with you before, and I, I document this in, in my book, the Last Days Identified. Do not forget this month's very special uh, two-book offer. Okay. The Last Days Identified, then comes the end. Well, what end? The end of the age that, that the disciples asked about. Okay. Normally, the price of this book, of, of both of these books, would cost you $10 more than June 2019 special. Now, I'm sorry this doesn't apply to overseas sales. If you want the books, perhaps in electronic form, pardon me, contact me and I'll help you out with that. But anyway, in, in this book and in this book, I show that the Jews had very firm beliefs. By the way, this is documented in Emil Schurer, uh, the history of the Jewish people in the time of Jesus the Messiah. Edersheim discusses it. Uh, N.T. Wright discusses it. On and on and on and on. This is not a preterist invention. The Jews believed in two ages. What they called this age and the age to come. They believed that, point number two, they believed that this age, what they called this age, was the age of Moses and the law, which is symbolized by the temple. The age to come was the age of Messiah and the new covenant. You catch that? Point number three. They believe that, quote, this age, the age of Moses and the law, was supposed to end, but the age of Messiah and the new covenant would never end. You catch that? The age of Messiah and the new covenant the everlasting kingdom of Daniel 7 will never pass away. That's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words, the new covenant, will never pass away. If you, if you can grasp the power of that single, that single point, that simple point, you know, Isaiah chapter 9. Of the speaking of the coming of Messiah and his kingdom sitting on the throne of David. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Well, you go to Hebrews chapter 12, 25 and following, which is built upon and is drawing from Daniel chapter 7, uh, 13 and 14. And the writer says that they were at that time in the process of receiving the kingdom which cannot be moved. Now, he's just discussed, and he is discussing, the old covenant kingdom of the law and the law of Moses. It was then being shaken, which meant removed. It, would no, it was going to be no longer valid, no longer binding, no longer operative as originally delivered. And established. But wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. In other words, it will never cease to function as it has been and is being delivered. Now, Mr. Frost's paradigm demands that one of these days, at the end of the world, did you notice the terminology? The annihilation of the world. Well, you see, Mr. Mr. Frost doesn't even believe in the annihilation of the world. He believes in a recreation of the world. That's not annihilation. 
So he destroys his own doctrine by his own terminology. But here's the point. Mr. Frost believes that in this supposed literal physical new, new heaven and earth, the gospel of Christ no longer functions. There is no evangelism. There's no need for evangelism because there is no evil. There is no sin. There is no death. And thus, in direct violation of Jesus' words, my word will never pass away. Mr. Frost says the disciples were asking about the end of the Christian age, the cessation of the function of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, that is in direct violation of Jesus' words. My words will never pass away. It is a direct violation of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, that they were receiving then a kingdom that will never pass away, never cease to function. And thus, when Mr. Frost tries to, um, tries to convince us that the disciples did, in fact, properly link the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple to the end of the physical world, the annihilation of the world. Here's the fact. Number one, the physical world was not annihilated at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Therefore, the disciples were wrong in Mr. Frost's paradigm. But wait, the disciples said they understood the teaching about the end of the age that Jesus talked about in Matthew 13. Therefore, if the disciples were right, unless they were lying, when they said they understood his teaching about the end of the age, and now in Matthew 24, they understood that this is tied to the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, and they link that with the end of the age, well, then guess what? Mr. Frost's concept about the end of the age is wrong. It is flat, dead, wrong. The disciples were not thinking about the end, about the annihilation of the world. They were not thinking about the end of the Christian age, which is endless. I hope you catch the power of that. You know, in reality, in reality, every single thing that Mr. Frost says in the remainder of his book falls and is falsified by this singular point. The Christian age has no end. Thanks so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. Listen, don't forget, go to my website, donkpreston.com, BibleProphecy.com. Order the June 2019 two-book special. It'll save you almost 10 bucks, okay? You will see in both of these books how distorted and how wrong Mr. Frost's claims are. Obviously, he wrote this book years after I wrote these. Doesn't matter. What you will find in these books is an utter desolation and destruction and refutation of what Mr. Frost has written. So go there. Take advantage of the special savings. We are almost halfway through June. I mean, you better take advantage of it. All right? Listen, you have a fantastic weekend. Please be safe. I'll see you on Monday.